Porter Anderson es un periodista de carrera y ex diplomático cuya lista de medios en la que ha participado es interminable. Porter tiene una habilidad especialmente notable en los comunicadores profesionales y es que una vez que se sienta contigo, eh, no importa el entorno, si es un escenario en un auditorio, si es una habitación, en una pequeña sala de, de prensa, hace que te sientas la persona más importante del mundo. La lista de medios en la que ha participado es interminable, voy a tener que tirar de mi chuleta para poder contarlas. CNN, The Village Boy, Publishing Perspectives, The Bookseller, The Future Book, Thought Catalog, The La Dallas Times Herald, The Dallas Observer, The Magazine, The Tampa Tribune, The Sarasota Herald Tribune y bastantes más que me dejo fuera. En la actualidad es el redactor jefe de Publishing Perspectives, la revista oficial de la Feria del Libro de Frankfurt y uno de los medios más seguidos en la industria. Anderson ha participado y ha moderado eventos y conferencias en Frankfurt, Singapur, Estocolmo, Italia, Berlín, Madrid, Nueva Delhi, Londres, Milán, Nueva York City y muchos otros. Eh, durante un montón de años ha dirigido el programa de booksellers en Londres, eh, el programa de la Feria Digital de Londres, el programa del IDPF y eh, eventos en Sarja, Abu Dhabi, Atenas y San Francisco. Ha ejercido de crítico, reportero, editor, redactor, jefe, locutor, coordinador, productor diplomático y jefe de sección. Anderson ha realizado críticas de libros, de obras de teatro y de obras multimedia durante más de tres décadas. Hoy Porter nos va a hablar de las tendencias a las que se enfrenta el mundo editorial ante la evolución de los distintos medios de entretenimiento y de cómo la pandemia ha cambiado los ámbitos de consumo. Hello, my name is Porter Anderson. I'm editor-in-chief at Publishing Perspectives magazine. I'm delighted to be speaking to you in the Madrid Book Fair. We're very excited about the program you're doing this autumn. I know it's not as large as what we had all hoped to be doing in the summer, but next summer is coming and we're all looking forward to it. In the meantime, what I'm doing today um, is giving you some sense for where in our coverage of the international publishing scene, we see things today in this strangest of all years. So many confusions, so many worries and fears, and so many challenges for publishing, for books, for readers, and certainly for the professionals in the industry. It's a complex time, a difficult time, with many questions we just don't know the answer to yet. But what I can do is give you a sense for what we see now, where we think we're going, and what we think may be the most important influences to watch as we get toward what I hope will be our vaccinated future soon. So I'm going to switch over and uh, show you a presentation here and keep talking to you as we go. And we will then be able to give you some sense for how things look from where we sit at Publishing Perspectives. What we're looking at, of course, is uh, the most of unfinished years. It is just a very difficult time to know how things are going to look when we finally come out of where we've been this year and what we've all been through. But we can see at least five very important things to remember that give us heart, that give us hope right now. The publishing industry, as it has developed for books in the world today, is fully globalized. The world still reads. And if any message came across to us during the pandemic, that was one of the most important. We suddenly found that instead of people going straight to nothing but television or nothing but uh, streaming films on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, instead what they did was read. They did all kinds of things to find their books. One of my most favorite pictures from the season has been that of a lady standing outside a bookstore in New York. She cannot go in because it's not safe, but she's on the phone and in the window is the bookseller showing her the book to make sure it's the right one that she wants to buy. And he will then pass it out to her with no contact. It's wonderful to see customers like this working so hard to get their books. Very heartening, very exciting. And it taught us something. It taught us that maybe books are still very very much alive in people's imaginations and people's desires in terms of how to get through things, particularly in hard times. Literature, of course, influences culture. And today we see that in a crashing way in nonfiction. It's soaring right now, particularly because, and this is not just in the United States, because of politics. The crisis of the pandemic, the crises of the political situations around the room, around the world, all of these things are driving people to books to understand, 
to find out what is happening. Where are we going next? What does this mean? It's great to see. Publishing people, we've learned, are still spotting trends. Although we are now an industry driven by consumers, I would say, rather than by the professionals of the industry who used to decide all on their own what books needed to be read. Now we listen to the consumers, but it is still up to publishing people to look ahead, understand the trends, understand what people need to know and get ahead of that with the books they're bringing out. It's now more important than ever to think forward and to see what's up ahead. Reading books supports critical thinking and having mentioned politics, nobody needs to say any more about how much we need critical thinking today. And literature owns a place in storytelling. This is very important for us to remember. Too many of our publishing folks sometimes forget what we are competing with, and we'll talk about this some more. But the important thing is to understand that literature is still one of the genesis points, one of the originating points of some of the best storytelling in the world. When we remember that, we do our best work. First, I'm going to look very briefly at some of our international markets with you and, and take a look at where we see some of the damage being done by the pandemic. There are varying stages of recovery underway, thank heavens. We are hoping that the, uh, the resurgence we're seeing as I speak right now in Spain is not going to be too difficult and too hard on your market. But at least while that happens, while France is suffering, the UK is suffering, my country, the United States, is in a terrible situation with the virus, we hope that we have seen the worst of the damage to publishing. During the, the pandemic, many of our international markets have actually fared less well than my own, the United States, and I will be comparing Comparing things sometimes to the states, I should explain because we are the dominant market, it was simply the largest, simply the one doing the most business. Um, overseas, physical bookstores are much bigger as a point of sale than in the United States. We'll talk about that a bit too. That has to do with the fact that we are accustomed here to buying online. And so it was not such a leap of faith for us as it was for some people in the world to start buying their books online during the pandemic. But in Italy, publishers expect to lose 650 to 900 million euros this year. And that is a 988 million of their usual annual 3.8 billion. So you're looking at a third of their income. I mean, this is really very difficult. In France, a quarter of the publishing houses are reporting that they will lose 40% or more of their 2020 revenue to the virus. In Spain, with more than 3,650 bookstores, we are so envious of you for this, two for each 25,000 people, so many bookstores. The market is trying to encourage consumers to go to bookshops. And I've been very impressed with the FGEE's marvelous um, uh, program on social media, trying to get people back in and going to the bookstores. Stories start in bookstores. It's, it's a perfectly marvelous campaign, and I hope, it's, I hope it's being effective. In the United Kingdom, they are now, of course, even, even months later, having to quarantine books. When customers come into a store and touch them, they have to remove those books for several days to get them cleaned up before they can put them back onto the shelf. There are many difficult, difficult issues going on. Also in the UK, they've just started a second round of funding having given out more than one million pounds to authors in hardship they're now having to fundraise again with a whole gala series of events online to try to get more money to help the authors they are all in such terrible shape and things are not getting better yet now, in the United States, just to give you kind of the touchstone of where things stand, the industry did at the time of the pandemic lose about 1% in its sales. Previously, our worst moment was in 2009, the, the terrible financial crisis of that era. Um, and we were down at that point at 4%. But I can tell you the recovery, which we hope is good news for everyone, the recovery in the States is very fast. At this point, we've just gotten a new report from uh, Chris and McLean, our great friend at NPD Books, she is spotting 6.3% growth 
year to date. In other words, at this point in the year, we are ahead of where we were last year. And so the states has come back very fast. Everyone has moved right back into buying and things seem to be on track. This is something we're hoping is going to spread. We're hoping that other markets will see a very quick turn too. It's 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 better than a V at this point. You know, the V recovery we talk about. It's it's looking really very good. In its worst week, the United States business was down 2.5 million units from 12.5. As you can tell, that's a huge, huge drop. The low point was the week ending in March 28th. That's very shortly before Easter. Uh, Many books had releases delayed, of course. Um, That's causing quite a bottleneck now in the autumn as those books start to move to market. Uh, We look like the French rentrée, if you will, because we suddenly have so many books at once. Um, The book business, of course, transfers more easily to working at home because remote working is possible. And so in terms of how our publishers were able to handle it, it was not as difficult as it was for many of our industries. As a mechanic, you can't work on cars in your own living room, but as a publishing house worker, as an editor, as a designer, you can. That was a very good thing for our publishing houses. Many in the future will actually use less of the space they've paid a lot of money to rent, particularly in the New York area, very expensive because they've learned that their employees can work from home. A very good educational point, although with way too high a price, of course. Post the pandemic, we may see more telecommuting, as I'm saying, and while bookstores have taken a hit, the USA is much farther and has been for many years in terms of digital selling. Uh, and we were able, uh, with, with so, a couple of exceptions of distribution, we were able to see good delivery, slower delivery, but good delivery even of physical books during the pandemic. And so we had good luck with online retail. That, of course, is one of the reasons we managed as well as we did. Now, in disruption, we we need to go back about a decade for a moment here, just to remember where we've come from. It will help us focus where we are now. Ebooks were initially disliked by fans of print. Uh, quite hostile. There, there was a great deal of umbrage when they first started appearing. They were seen as threatening to what they called real books on paper, right? Audio was originally, <laughs> you may remember, first on cassette tapes, And then on CDs, it was a very um, um, impractical medium as a a hard medium uh, and in a hard format. Um, Very difficult. Your car was full of these silly tapes. It was a mess. And it really did not um, exist as a going thing a decade ago. It was not so powerful. Digital self-publishing was starting to take off, enabled by the Kindle system, and appeared to be a potential danger to trade publishing. Of course, this was more of the resistance, more of the hostility. And the rise of digital retail was frightening to many in publishing. It appeared to them as something likely to shut down independent bookstores and to take control of the market. Ten years later, as I like to say, what a difference a decade makes. A pandemic actually taught us, among its many lessons, that digital looked a lot better than we thought it did originally. When you have to deliver books safely, when you want something no human hand has touched, when you want no one with the possibility of transmitting the virus uh, through the air to you, ebooks look real good. Audiobooks sound real good. And ebooks have been a source of revenue for publishers and authors during the pandemic. StatShot, which is the Association of American Publishers uh, metric system for measuring the market's progress, saw ebooks rise 13% during the pandemic. Retail platforms don't report this, so um, online retail is what I'm saying. So we don't get to see their results, but in terms of where the publishers can tell us exactly what was happening for their own content, a 13% bump is quite uh, remarkable in the American market for ebooks. Audiobooks have been growing very fast, and so big bumps for them is not unusual. But interestingly, 
there was a slowdown at the beginning. Audiobooks were less listened to, and it turned out that's because people were not on their commutes. They were not driving home and listening to books. They were not driving to work and listening to books. They were not on the subway. They had less time. Gradually, they have come back, and very strongly, because people found time in their home-based lives uh, to maybe go off by themselves, let the children be uh, in, with someone else for a bit, and listen to their books. And so audiobooks, uh, listening has resurged in the United States, very healthy way. But it was interesting to see that dip right at first. And we realized how very much audiobook listening and podcasts are tied to the commuting to and from work. A couple of years ago, the United States passed the point at which more books are sold through online retail than in physical stores. These are print books, of course. We want our bookstores to thrive. This is why I'm so envious of your many bookstores in Spain. But like ebooks and print, physical and digital retail can coexist. And we were very glad to have so much digital retail going on to keep our books selling during the pandemic. Many publishers have become quite innovative in digital marketing, supporting authors with publicity, like the 60,000 fans that Penguin Random House Grupo Editorial had waiting for their Spanish author. His name, you, I bet you know him, is Javier Castillo, very popular author. He did a first time online reading. He had never done this before because his 30 city tour of Spain and of Latin America was canceled by the uh, pandemic and the coronavirus stopped all of that and it shut down the bookstores two days before Javier's new book came out. But when they set up an online reading, 60,000 fans. That is innovation. That is using digital. That is smart. And this is yet another way that we've been able to keep the publishing industry afloat in so many of our markets around the world is by really activating and embracing the digital capabilities that we used to be a bit afraid of. You have, I'm very excited um, about this. We've just reported it. You have two new unlimited subscription formats coming into the Spanish market. And this is quite exciting news. Both Amazon's Audible, which is the largest in the world, it's very big, of course, marvelous selection, um, and has been in Latin America for a time, is coming into Spain with its own uh, Audible unlimited subscription program. Very nice to have. We do not have such a good deal on Audible subscription in the United States. We envy you that. And Podima, a new one. I, I am not yet familiar with it. I'm learning uh, more about it as quickly as I can. It too has just launched. This then gives new uh, competition to Storytel Spain. Storytel is based in Stockholm, as you may know, and is one of the most aggressively expansive in the world of our online um, unlimited subscription services in digital media. So we're very excited to see both Podima and Audible move into the Spanish market. It means that your market is doing a very good job of uptake both on audiobooks and on ebooks and this is a great way to be going very remarkable build and we think that surely the scales are tipping now toward digital we cannot encourage this more it is the right thing to happen in an age like our own The uh, Federation of Publishers Guilds, FGEE we call them, have done a wonderful survey of what was going on among the readership during the uh, pandemic, uh, and particularly in Spain, it was fascinating to see that women and uh, readers under 35, the younger readers, were making the biggest increases in their readership during the pandemic. Um, this wasn't just school students either. These were actually young adults who were doing a lot more reading, as well as the children who were trying to, of course, do reading online for educational purposes. Um, weekly reading time during the lockdowns and confinement increased by 90 minutes, which is huge, to an average eight hours and 20 minutes per week. That's a marvelous average of time being spent. That's one working day uh, being spent reading. How marvelous. This was really good to see. Print remains the preferred medium, which still fascinates me. I, I love books that glow in the dark. I like my ebooks, but many people still prefer print uh, by 83%. 
for reading books. So that means, of course, that they were having them delivered by bookstores uh, to their homes or by other means, carriers, couriers coming in to get them their print books if possible. And if not, they went to ebooks and to audiobooks. And despite the preference for print, 38% of respondents, sure enough, said they had read digitally. We think now that many have tried it and may like it better than they thought. They may discover digital reading is not so bad. I like this ebook. I like it to glow in the dark like Porter does. Maybe they'll all come in with me. Um, so this is interesting too. We think that the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of ebooks and of uh, audiobooks. Very interesting effect. Another thing we could never have seen coming, you know. Now, where, where are we at this point if we look back at our five great things? Remember, I started with five points about publishing that are just wonderful. Fully globalized, translation now becomes the future. One of the things to understand is that as so many entertainments bombard us and give us so many alternatives to reading, selling books may not be as lucrative for publishers as it once was. That sounds crazy. You say, well, what else do they do? They have to sell books. Ah, but who do they sell them to? And what do they sell? Now they sell the rights to those books to be translated into other countries. And that, the international rights trade, is hot. It is so hot. It is heating up so fast. More and more digital platforms for rights trading are coming online. More and more forums are out there in the virtual space to help agents and publishers come together, to help scouts find books, bring them to agents, take them to producers, and have them made into film. And so that entire system of selling rights for many, many things. I mean, you can sell the rights for the characters if you want to a very popular work. All of this licensing and rights work is coming to the fore and helping to ease the fact that you may not have as many actual book sales, but you sure can sell your rights. Literature influencing culture, as I said, in politically charged times like these, it's only getting bigger. We're, we're watching um, the book by Donald Trump's daughter, uh, sorry, niece. Um, her name is Mary L. Trump. The book is called um, Too Much and Never Enough. It is now in its 11th week at the top of the Amazon charts. It is soaring. They can't keep enough in print. They've gone way past 1 million copies already. Some of these books just catch fire because people are so fascinated by the political scene. And nonfiction is just booming. Publishing people spot trends. Remember that one? Good publishing always leads rather than following the trends. And we're, fat, we're getting better at that, particularly because the pandemic gave everyone a chance to to stop and think for a minute what folks would like to see. It is good at times to simply concentrate on where you are and what may be coming next. Reading books supports critical thinking. You remember that point? Immersive reading trains minds to focus. One of the things that is perhaps of a little bit of concern about audiobooks is that people who listen to all of their books are not remembering to read. They're not using their imaginations in the same way, and they're not immersing themselves in the act of reading as they did. We can't say that listening is in any way not as good or better than reading with your eyes, but we're interested to see where this takes us because we do think that the, the act of immersive reading, as we call it, meaning sitting for a long period of time or reading an extensive novel, is not as, as easy for folks. It's not coming as easy, easily, particularly to young people, but even adults who used to read for long times with no problem focused on a book are having trouble focusing now. This is an interesting thing too, something that the publishing industry has to adapt to. And literature owns a place in storytelling. As I was telling you about licensing and rights, a book is on the same digital device. It's on your phone, right? Right there with your films, right there with your television shows, your games, your music. We have to, in publishing, be able to compete with these various media, which is quite a trick. So here are some of the challenges. Because we are um, in this competitive space, that's the first we need to start with. This is historically unprecedented. Understand that in the past, yes, people could go to films at their cinema 
um, and did. Uh, and that went on for the, the whole 20th century, of course. I mean, very early in the 20th century, film was becoming a, a, an entertainment to be reckoned with. But never before was it right on the same device, as I was saying. And never before was it in your living room all the time, on your television, in your bedroom, wherever you have screens. It was never on a computer in front of you. Suddenly, everything that electronic media is producing for the audience is taking them away from reading unless we can hold their attention. And so books must be chosen very carefully. They must be very important. There must be a reason and a need for a book to go out because it's going to have to swim upstream, as we say. It's going to have to fight its way through a great deal of other very attractive media. We're in a golden age of film and television. Some of the marvelous production being done by Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and directors who are working on many platforms now um, is really terrific stuff. Very high literary value is coming across in these modes now we have to be very clever and make sure that we can compete with equally good material uh, the battle for the attention con economy this is what we're calling it uh, that i give thanks to um, michael tamblin the ceo of racket and kobo for first saying the attention economy to a large gathering of us in berlin a couple of years ago um, at the publishers forum and he's absolutely right what we're trying to do is get everyone's attention can we tell them to stop watching netflix long enough to read a book very difficult we have to work on this diversity in the united states is a very difficult issue and and one we have not had a lot of success in fixing yet i'm sorry to say we're trying to get better with it um, we are an industry these these numbers are very close to those in the uk as well we are an industry that is 70 percent uh, 76 percent white 81 percent heterosexual, 89% uh, non-disabled, 74% are women. This sounds good. We, Of course, we want to see women succeed in the industry. At the same time, if your industry, any industry, is so imbalanced by one gender or another, are you producing as much material for the other gender as you would be? Let's switch it, put it on the other foot, and let's say that it was a 74% male industry. Could all of those men possibly produce as much good material for girls and women as they should? I, I can say as a man, I doubt it. So when we look at an industry that is so overpowered by women, this is actually a diversity problem we need to think about. Um, where, where women are not faring well is in the upper reaches. It's very hard for them to reach the CEO level. The, uh, there, there are many fine women directors, but there are not as many executives yet as we'd like to see. Many of our houses are working on this very seriously, though. All of these issues in diversity are being taken very, very seriously and being really attacked on all the best levels to try to make some movement happen. Um, a pipeline to the street to the screens one of the things that I advise every publisher to do is to get very close to a, a studio a film and television studio and to find a producer who's on the same wavelength as your publishing house understanding your list and knowing what that producer wants to take to that studio to propose for film and television development becomes all the more important because getting things onto the screens now getting our stories out there is absolutely essential it, it is where the market lives um, the primacy of storytelling this is what we're talking about are we still the place where the best stories start not always. There are actually pieces now being made in Hollywood that have no book behind them. And uh, we need to think about that. There, there have always been some pieces, of course, that began as a screenplay. But for much of our, our modern history, the, the material going forward in film and television has started in some form of, of the written word. Now it doesn't nearly as much. And a lot of our best writers are going into the screen work. Maybe they're not going to be writing books. Again, this is something we have to be aware of, think about very consciously, and start learning how we want to respond. So book publishing today, um, as I mentioned, uh, Kristen McLean from um, NPD, the research group, said to me, she said, you know, it's in restart. 
And this is exactly what's happening. What we're seeing that the pandemic may have given us, as difficult as it was, and despite the tragic loss of life, uh, nothing can ever make up for that. But as an industry, as the publishing industry, as the books business, what we can look at now is a kind of restart that we have a chance to take advantage of if we will do it, if we will think, sort out what we need to do, understand where we're going, what our potentials are, and respond to what we've learned, we may come out a better industry, bruised, uh, struggling to deal with damages, but with a better future than we had. The necessary goal is to establish, to promote, and dependably provide meaningful, relevant, diverse, and insightful content to a world that is in remarkable upheaval and growth on so many levels we are all going through so many changes never before have we had more need for the right books not just for easy entertainment not just for something quick and and fast to put out but for actually important material this is why i keep saying that we must choose our best books and probably fewer books publishers need to do fewer books and market them better so that they have enormous success and give our authors the chances they need to really be heard with their best material. The old style effect was to just throw more books into the, into the market. If things weren't selling well, we'll give them more. That's not the answer anymore. The answer now is to be more selective and to really hone down on exactly what the right read, the right story is for your audience and get it out there where they need it and market it, give it support so that it can find its audience and not just get lost in the back shelves of the bookshop. Right? Now, if you're looking for daily updates on the international publishing scene, we publish them Monday through Friday at Publishing Perspectives. We would love to have you as a reader. We are a free service. We were founded 10 years ago by Frankfurt Book Fair in New York, the New York office of Frankfurt Buchmesser. And we, in that sense, are a service for which you pay nothing. And we try to make sure we hit as many nations of the world, as many markets of the world, in terms of their trends, in terms of what's impacting the industry, where it's going, and what we need to know as we go forward. We'd be delighted to have you come to us. Thank you for listening to this. It's, it's been very good to talk with you. I do want to see you all uh, next summer when we're all together. I hope, I hope, um, in Madrid. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you so much for having me. It's been good to chat. I will now pop myself back over by coming out here in order to say goodbye to you. Thanks again. Thank you.